I'm Kim Dwinell. I'm the author of the Surfside Girl series. So welcome to San Diego Comic-Con at home. You know what? Really, honestly, I'm so over Zoom panels and all that. Let's just go surfing. I'm Kim Dwinell. I'm an illustrator, animator, professor, and I'm a lifelong surfer and lover of the ocean. So if you want to learn to surf, there's two different kinds of surfboards here. There's a longboard and there's a shortboard. If you're learning, this is probably your best bet. A longboard has more surface area, easier to paddle and catch a wave. There's just more of it, right? Um, so this is your better bet. You're going to be catching more waves. Um, super fun and will totally get you hooked. Once you're really good at this, you understand waves and you're getting up all the time, you can try a shortboard. A shortboard works a little bit more like a skateboard where you're really moving around the wave more like an acrobat. The longboard here, if you see style on a longboard, it's people moving their feet up and down, hanging five, hanging ten, getting out on the nose, doing 360s. Um, but on this shortboard, you're going to be acting more like a skateboard, and you can even catch air and come re-enter the wave. There's actual science behind why this is the truth. And you can see there's something called rocker in a board. You can see how curvy the shortboard is, and you can see the longboard doesn't have as much rocker. Rocker helps you get into the wave, and you can see that the wave's going to need to be steeper and curvier to take this board. This can catch a bump, right? It's got a lot of surface area, and it's a lot flatter. There, there's another part of the surfboard that's important, too, and that is the skags. These are skags, and these are what hold you down into the wave like a keel holds a sailboat. So having skags on is an important part of uh, keeping you solid in the wave. Sometimes you won't have a middle fin, and that's called a fish, and they're very skiddy around the waves. Having this nice, long uh, center skag is what keeps you firmly grounded in that wave. Hey, look who I've got here. This is Dr. Chris Lowe, who's the director of the Shark Lab at Cal State Long Beach, professor of marine biology, and so graciously helped me out with the science of surfing, my new Surfside Girls book. So we're down here at the beach. Let's talk some science. Absolutely. So it's low tide right now. It is low tide. And you know, we discuss tides in my book. Tides are a big part. Like surfers really have to pay attention to tides because there are some beaches you can't surf on a low tide. There's rocks, mm -hmm. stuff is exposed. Some, sometimes you need a tidal change. Yep. And what is it that makes the tides? So the tides are affected by the moon. The moon. That's right. This is the coolest thing to, dis to like really discover in my research. Yeah, and, and it's, it's the gravitational pull. Imagine water being pulled away from the planet. Sucking. I have in my book a vacuum and a water balloon. Yep. And it just sucks kind of this, it distorts the planet, yep. pulls that ocean away as we're spinning, right? Exactly. So we're kind of spinning through yep. these tides. And, and Seal Beach here has the two high tides. That's and correct. the two low tides. Um, each day, mm -hmm. each day. And what's really cool is some places only have one high tide and one low tide each day. It's super weird. Isn't it? So what do you think causes that? You know, I have no idea. So it's the topography. It's the shape oh. of the coastline oh. that can affect that and where you are in proximity to the equator. Speaking of that, in my book, I have this, we were at this surfing beach in Ireland mm -hmm. called La Hinge, and their tidal range is 15 feet. 
you have this gorgeous beach with a seawall and you've got these cute little shops up on the and then when it's high tide there is no beach it is at the top of the road almost coming over into these shops yep. it's an amazing thing and all because of our moon exactly and I also learned in this book how cool it is to track like the cycle of the moon, which mm -hmm. always shows up in your tide chart. Like yep. when is it full and when is it new? And that's important. Because Absolutely, because you get higher highs and lower lows. Because sometimes it aligns with the sun, doesn't it? That's right. And that's why we're seeing the new moon. Mm -hmm. And then we've got the sun pulling and we've got the moon pulling and it's really distorting that planet, exactly. pulling out that tide. Sucking that water out, Sucking right? that water like the vacuum. Higher highs and lower lows. Yeah, and that's really important for a surfer to know because, like I said, sometimes if it's super low and all the rocks are exposed, you certainly don't want to be paddling out. And conversely, if it's too high and there's too much water, the waves can't, can't form. Absolutely. So the topography, the shape of the beach is going to affect your waves, right? Yeah, and that brings up another point. Like that, that topography also, it, when that wave is coming from far out at sea, a storm, pushing that energy, the physics of that wavelength through the ocean, which is so fascinating to study. And then it encounters that landmass, right? Pop, Yep. right? And then that's shoaling, is that right? Yep. It's called shoaling, and that's what we surf. That's when it jacks up. That's when it jacks up. Yep. And there's, there's a, like it's interesting to, to know what your beach looks like. Mm -hmm. And also like that place in Portugal that's got this right. Nazare yep. Canyon that is so deep that those waves are the biggest waves on the yep. planet. They get to like 80 feet and people surf them. Yeah. Not like this. Not like, not like this. this. No. no. I would not be comfortable in that. Uh, but Ray Bay is great. Ray Bay is great. You know, I've got our little rookie here. We've got all kinds of biology. Absolutely. We have a turtle colony. Uh, we have turtles. That's right. Sea turtles. So remember, for when it comes to tides, the animals that live at beaches really are dependent on tides. Because there are some animals okay. that are yes. stuck to rocks. Okay, like those and, rocks over there. Absolutely, mm -hmm. and their distribution, how they got there, was dependent on the tides. So some of them like to get wet all the time. Yep. Some of them want to be splashed. Yep. And then some of them want to dry out. Yep. And then I bet there's predators that know all about this. Absolutely, and they come up with the tide and they go down with the tide. And they know where the pickings are and when. Exactly. Uh -huh. And then there are the things that live in the sand. In the sand. Yeah. Uh, well, there's the sand crab, the little sand crab. Right. And I know they make the little bees yep. in the sand, and you yep. can kind of feel them on your feet when the when the tide sucks out. Yep. And I know they've got those feathery little antennas. Yeah. I what do they do with those? Well, they catch gook, right? And gook is good if well, you're a sand if crab. If you're a sand crab, <laughs> I'm, I'm not sure I love gook, but but yeah, they got those feathery things, and then they have the feathery little mitts too. Right? Yep. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> So obviously they couldn't be up too high because they wouldn't get any food. Right, okay. So the tide is going to affect where they're going to be. Do they ever get stranded in a high high? Like sure. the high high tide they come really up and then when it goes back down it never comes back up that way. That would be tragic for they them. They right? could get stranded. So when the tide comes up and the tide starts going back down, they're going to want to move back down. So they're mobile. Unlike a barnacle that's yes. stuck to a okay. rock, yeah. it can't move. Okay. So if it's in the wrong place, it's in trouble. It, it made a bad choice. Exactly. Bad choice. Yeah. But the sand crab can move down. But the danger is, if it's out and it's moving, it can be seen. Someone wants to eat it. Exactly. I think this, you know, the world, uh, doing this study and about how biodiversity works and all that, it really does seem like everyone's got an eyeball out for who can yeah. eat whom. And, I mean, I guess that's how it is. You know, they don't have bonds or, you know, no. a, a grocery store. Exactly. And, and it's part of a community. Even if you get eaten, or you're the eater, you're still part of a community. And you know, that brings up a good point. Like this, I love the ocean so much and the ocean is so big and beautiful and it connects us really across the planet and anywhere it shows up on land, it kind of presents with all this different biodiversity. And it's different depending on where you go, which is really cool. So at the equator, there's greater diversity than oh. when you get to the poles. Okay, all right, I guess that would make sense. Um, so do you know why? Well, I would guess not many not many creatures want to live at the poles. Am I right there? Yeah. Because it's cold. It's cold. It's and, cold. more importantly, it's completely dark in the winter and oh. full sun during the summer. Oh, yeah. Whereas at the equator, I didn't think about that. the day length is about the same year round. Interesting. And that would make, well, that, that would make a huge difference. So your conditions change yeah. dramatically at the poles 
and they're really stable towards the equator. Well, and I also know that with this, you have creatures like whales, right, that migrate up and take advantage of all these things that go down to Mexico and then come back up to Alaska, Antarctica. All the way to Alaska, that's right. And eat whatever's going on up there. Exactly. And I also, in my research, realized that the uh, the sandpiper, the western sandpiper, that little thing flies, nests on the tundra, right, of yep. Alaska, flies on its little teeny wings yep. all the way down here to Southern California. Yep. What is that? How many thousands of miles? Oh, that's... Thousands. Well, yeah, that's probably getting close to eight to 10,000 miles. On the little teeny wings, and they yeah. come down here, but when they go to nest, they go all the way back up yep. to the tundra. Yep. I don't know, I think I'd want to stay. I like it here. Yeah. I don't yeah. know about tundra. But, but it, think about the great seasonal buffet you get. <laughs> it's all about the food. I, that's what I have come to learn in this research. It is sort of all about the food. Okay. Wow, this stuff is super cool. Like there's, this stuff up here is like hard and crusty and then these guys are squishy. And look so, at crabs. Yeah, so these are barnacles, right? So barnacles actually attach to the rock when they're babies and they build a shell around it. And believe it or not, it is related to a shrimp. It's related to a shrimp. So yeah. I'm really not, am I gonna see any of this stuff out surfing? Hopefully this? not, because <laughs> if you're hitting this uh, when you're surfing, you're gonna be in trouble. This, okay. These animals typically grow on rocks. This is a stuck creature. So it's cousin the shrimp might be out there, but this little guy, he's stuck. And they have this little shell with the garage doors. And when the tide comes in, they open the garage doors and when food splashes and on what them, is food? What are we food is plankton? tiny plankton, plankton, little plants in the water, bacteria. Okay. That's all part of their buffet. All right. And then these squishy guys. Those are sea anemones. Oh, they're the flowery thing, but they're yep. all they're all. They're tucked in because there's no water over them. So if the water were to come up, they would open up. And you'd see their tentacles, right? Oh uh, yeah. Like an yeah, upside like a down flower? stuck jellyfish. Oh. Okay. And they wave those around, and they can sting their prey and shove them in their mouth. But Sting their prey. They the got tide skills. Is out. Yes, it's super low tide. So huh? now they tuck in to protect themselves and okay. prevent drying out. Oh, okay. So now even though out. they're stuck, yeah, they can move. Oh, oh, seriously. They can crawl very, oh, very slowly I didn't know that. and move to a new spot if they want. Okay. And and this this green stuff here, this ah. slippery stuff, is this is this kelp? Is this, this some is, sort of algae? Yeah, this is algae. It's algae. And okay. Algae is. Basically, it's a protozoa. This is the same. This is the same sort of algae as the macrocysta yes. that I do see when I'm out there yes. in the kelp forest. Yes. Right? So, so this basically is a species of algae uh -huh. that only gets about that big. Oh, this is it. Yep. And this okay. is known as a green alga. Okay. So it's a green algae, and a lot of the crabs feed on this. You'll see the Sally oh. Lightfoot's coming over. Yeah. Oh. Okay. And they'll do surf and turf, right? Yeah, I see a couple of these little guys here. Yep, so they'll They're nibble on dead snails and clams and and, okay. and these are little mussels, right? Okay, yeah. And there's yeah, a yeah. chitin right there, oh, see the chitin? Oh, there's the chitin, that's a cool thing, yeah. Yeah, so, so the chitons have eight plates. Always? Yep. Okay, and isn't that a prehistoric thing? It really is. It's been like, they have fossils of that. Yes, ah, and super they're a cool. snail, and they crawl they, along the rocks. Oh, they crawl, I thought they yep. were a stuck thing. Nope, no? they crawl. And they have a little tooth called a radula that they use to scrape off the algae and eat it. Oh. Yeah. Okay. So they're, think of them like goats. So they're, yes, they're the goats. <laughs> they're grazers. They're the goats. Yeah. Okay. Okay, so it looks like he's still got a couple more hours. Do you want to come back to the lab and check it out? Oh my gosh, I would love to. Really? Yeah. Oh yeah, let's, yeah, go. let's go. Let's go. Totally. You've been in the shark lab before. I have. This is one of my favorite buildings on campus. So amazing. It is really cool. It's nice having a facility that we get to design that oh, is gotcha. designed to meet our needs, which is great. Wow, yeah. Like when you're in a marine lab, things flood all the time. So it's really important they have good drains in the floor. Makes sense. That's important. Okay. And of course, we have new toys. You want oh, to see yes, some? Yes, please. Check, check this one out. So this is my pride and joy. This is an autonomous underwater robot. An underwater robot, and what does it do underwater? Uh, it can swim and chew gum at the same time, <laughs> which is something we can't. So on the nose, it has a whole set of environmental sensors. It okay. can measure oxygen concentration in the water. It can measure turbidity, how turbid the water is. Okay. Uh, it can measure pH. It can measure uh, conductivity, which tells us how salty the water is. Okay. 
and temperature, temperature and depth. Okay. So then what we can do is put video cameras on this. It's got a ear, so we can listen for our tag sharks. This and and so are you, are you like remote controlling this around somewhere? We can, but yes. we also give it a mission. We say, okay, okay, we want you to go to this place, this place, this place, and then we want you to go out and do a lawnmower pattern throughout okay. this habitat. All right. And while you're doing the lawnmower pattern, we want you to dive up and down between the surface and the bottom. So okay. we give it instructions, we give it coordinates mm -hmm. on where to go, okay. and then we say, go mow the lawn. Okay. <laughs> and then six hours later, it pops up and wow. it has Wi-Fi. Okay. So it sends us a signal saying, I'm done, done. come get me. Okay. And then we go pick it up. Nice. And so it's, it's doing all this stuff for water and it's also tracking your sharks. Yeah. yeah. So we can also trick this thing out with hydrophones, which listen for sound. Okay. And we can put a hydrophone in the nose and a hydrophone on the back. And then when a tag shark is swimming around with a transmitter on it, and that transmitter produces a sound that radiates out like a donut. Okay. As that sound radiates out, if it hits this hydrophone before this hydrophone, the robot knows that the shark is somewhere over here. Okay. And then... And it's, it sends you back information telling you like, hey, there's a shark here. Uh, or it does it on its own. Okay. Like, we don't have to need that information. It we goes just and say, finds it. You find the shark, you follow the shark, but don't get too close to the shark. Because sometimes the sharks can hear it because it has a propeller, it makes oh, noise. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's, a, it's a beautiful thing. It like, really it's a is. a really pretty thing. So you want to see some sharks? You know I do. <laughs> Hop Who's up. in this tank? All right. So we have in this tank a oh. leopard shark. Oh, he's in my book. Yeah. I drew him in my book. Those pretty patterns. Uh, they are probably one of the most beautiful sharks that we have in California. Oh, I used to, when I lifeguarded in Laguna and we would do swims in the coves, I would see them in the bottom. You can see them. Yep. They're so pretty. And when they're little babies, they're so cute. Aw. Oh. This is called a gray smooth hound. That's another species common along beaches. I've not seen him. He's got such a long tail. They are literally the kind of the gray ghosts of the beach. He's beautiful, or she. That's a she. That's a she? Yep. She's giving birth to some babies. Oh, and yep. who's in the corner there? That is called a swell shark. Swell shark. Okay. Why do you think they call it a swell shark? Uh, is it right there in the impact zone? Uh, you would think. See, you're thinking like a surfer. I'm thinking like a surfer. Um, if something tries to grab it, It'll suck water into its stomach, causing it to swell up, so it can't be no swallowed. No kidding. <laughs> well, the ocean's amazing. See, you were thinking like a surfer. I, uh, yes, you said swell. Um, so what do you do with these guys here? What, so what, these, what is this for? These sharks are used primarily for uh, display. So okay. when we're training students to be marine biologists, it's really important that they get to see live animals, right? So cool. So while they get to go in the field and do field trips, we can take them literally in the classroom and bring them out here and show them sharks. And say things like, for example, how do you think that tail works differently from, say, that of a fish? And mm -hmm. that shark, if it stops swimming, will sink. Huh. So if huh. you look at its morphology, its tail shape, yeah. its pectoral fins, um, it needs those fin shapes in order to stay afloat. And do I remember correctly that they, they, uh, they move constantly? Some do. Some do? Like, like those, he doesn't, obviously he's quite inert there. So the way they breathe is they can open and close their mouth and suck enough water in to breathe. Okay. But some sharks can't do that. They have to swim in order okay. to breathe. Okay, how, how about that white shark that always keeps coming up? Does that thing have to keep moving or does it, it does. sit on the bottom? It no, does. No, it does. They have to swim. So that, that's probably one of the reasons why they're the Olympians of sharks. Right? <laughs> as much as I love them, I, it, would, it would make my heart flutter, I think, if I was in the lineup and saw uh, one in front of me. I would flutter a bit, I'll admit, Kim, although I love... <laughs> I can guarantee they've swam right by you. <laughs> Don't tell me. I love seeing the leopard sharks, though. Yeah, they they're, are sweet. they're definitely a fave. Sweet. That's what they do just for the attack. <laughs> That was a joke. Bad, bad shark biologist joke. They're actually really cool. So this thing could be alien, right? So Totally. So their front jaw is like normal, and they have teeth on the bottom part of their jaw, the bottom part of their mouth, yeah. in the middle, and on the top. And that's when they bite, they hold. But they have another set of jaws in their throat. A whole other set. 
So as something comes in, they use the second set of jaws to grab it, and then they use the second set of jaws to They have to a second set of jaws in their jaws? In their throat. In their throat? In their throat. No way! That is like an alien. Yes. So they are definitely like a weird alien fish. It is so cute though. It's so charming. They are. They are just charming. And then you tell me that like it, it has multiple jaws like it has alien. multiple jaws. But hey, yeah. kind of like a cat, like your house cat's so sweet and then it mm. beheads mice and, and bats exactly. around birds. Yeah, exactly. but, but that's what it does. That's what they do. The other really cool thing about these animals is they have hundreds of vertebrae. Vertebrae. Right, so the more vertebrae you have, the more flexible you can be. Right? Okay. So they look at, it's already winding its yeah, body yeah. through the yeah, brick, yeah. right? Okay, so let's say it wants to take a bite off something that's too big to swallow. Okay. How do you think they do it? Oh, I, I have no idea. It doesn't wrap it, does it? It's not like a, a snake. Um, sort of. Does it? So one thing it can do is spin. So it'll bite on something and then it will spin like, like a Like an alligator. Yep. Ah. And tear things off. The other oh. thing it can do is throw an overhand knot into its body and run it all the way down to its head. No kidding. And use that as leverage to. It can knot itself? Yes. We're out in the ocean yesterday at Doheny, and, and there's like a hundred pelicans came and sat, and they're all eating fish, and they're coming up with fish, and they're diving all around us, and, and boy, it was magical. And I thought to myself, you know, they're eating a lot of fish. Who else is eating these fish? And like, as a surfer, I don't know, should I be worried? So, not really. Okay. Well, you know what a bait ball is. I do know, it's in my book, actually. I have bait ball in my book. I'm fascinated with them. Okay, so you've got a bunch of fish that live in a school. Yes. And they're out there eating plankton and things like that, making okay. their living. And okay. then a fish comes from beneath them yeah, yeah. and tries to eat them. Okay. So that pushes all the school up to the surface. And we're talking about a bunch of fish. We're talking about millions. Millions of fish, millions of little bait fish. All hanging out together because there's safety in numbers. Got it, okay. There's lots of food out there and then fish are coming at them from below, which push them up to the surface. And then those pelicans I are going, see. ah, look at that cloud down there. Oh. I see. And I, I know in my book, I put that they can die from great heights because they can see and they've got like that bubble wrap stuff in their chest. They can blow up air sacs and dive and get fish. So we're watching this unfold in front of us. It's amazing. It, it's truly amazing, right? So that's the food chain in action, right? That is the food chain in action. So we had the plankton, we got the little bait fish, we got the, the big guys coming up from the bottom and mm -hmm. the, what, maybe seals? Sure. How about sharks? Well, sure. I mean, it's the ecosystem, right? So you've got plankton, you've got yeah. big fish eating those, you've got bigger fish eating those, you've got pelicans, you've got seals. Maybe right? something bigger? Maybe. I didn't see any dolphins. I didn't see any dolphins. They'll take their turns. Okay. Everybody takes their turns. So. Uh, and the key is there has to be enough fish out there. Okay. Right? So right. if there are okay. no bait fish yeah. and there are no bait balls, there's no pelicans. So what we're saying is that that shows that the ocean's really healthy, and that's good. Like the ocean's functioning as it should. Exactly. And and as a surfer out there, because I thought to myself, like this is really cool. I'm really excited that I get mm -hmm. to experience this. Do I need to pull my feet up? Like, are they? <laughs> so how interested is the shark in me? Exactly. So keep in mind, seeing a bait ball when you're out in the water is awesome, right? Totally. There's birds diving, totally. it's splashing, it's excitement, right? But you on a surfboard actually provide cover. So a lot of times the, the bait balls will come to you Ooh. and they'll try mm. to hide under you. Oh. Mm -hmm. And then your feet are dangling in the water and things are charging through and you don't want your foot to get mistaken for a fish. Oh, good thought. Okay, so, so, I, so I have to be a little bit cautious. Around bait balls. Around bait balls. And if bait balls start to form around you, it's time <laughs> to pull <laughs> arms and legs up. Just for safety. Okay, so as I'm paddling in, I was at Doheny yesterday, like I said, and like there's so much, there's all the rocks and the, the tide pool kind of things. Yep. And I was seeing that like there were sea stars and I saw sea cucumbers as the tide's going out. Um, super cool and they yep. get huge. They do. They get huge. And I, I know that you've got some in, in here. You've got some. We do. Yeah. We do. And okay. they love to eat mussels. They love to eat oh, okay. clams. They love to eat whatever's growing in those rocks. Right. Because that, like, what zone is that again? That's the intertidal the zone? Inter is that intertidal zone? zone? Yeah, right. okay. So I have that in part of my book. Think of them like coyotes, except really primitive ones. And not fuzzy and, and not sharp fuzzy. teeth. Okay. But they <laughs> love to eat mussels, right? Okay. So they're eating all the things that are growing on the rocks. And they use hydraulics to do it. Okay, 
Oh, physics. Ah, yes. ah physics. So they the have physics of the ocean. suckered tube feet, right? Okay. And they use water hydraulics as a way of oh. putting pressure on the on the muscle of the clam until its muscles weaken, and then when its muscle weakens. So they're like a little jet pack? Are they like sucking in? Is that how they're uh, making suction? It, it's like a suction cup. And okay. they doesn't it doesn't take very much energy for them to just apply constant pressure, and then the clam or muscle gets weak. And all its shell has to do is open a little bit. Okay. And then the sea star puts its stomach into the shell and eats the animal while it's in its shell and then pulls its stomach back. That's interesting. I'm glad that we don't function that way. I think I would feel a little um, vulnerable with my stomach hanging out in a, in a shell. But remember, it's protected by the shell. So you got that going for you, <laughs> right? So when I was young, I was spending all this time in the ocean surfing. I started surfing at Doheny and um, I took a marine biology class and I got really, really interested and I was taking physics. And I'll tell you what, honestly, I can't keep up with the math. I got really intimidated that maybe I wasn't smart enough to be a scientist. And I'm really, really happy I found my way back to this mm -hmm. through illustration and actually I came from animation, which is physics. Right. It's really physics, right. but I couldn't do it from the math side and therefore I didn't become a scientist. Um, what do you think about that? I don't know. I think you're underestimating yourself. So remember, you're actually seeing the numbers, but you're seeing them differently. So there are people who can look at something and see the numbers in it, right? It's what do you not... mean by the numbers? So when you're watching a fish swim, okay. they're actually calculating the, how far the tail moves and how fast the tail is wagging and how much force is being generated. Okay. They can see those numbers in their head, but not everybody can. Yes. But nonetheless, you understand the concept. I can draw it. I can understand it in timing. Yeah. So you just can't see the numbers. That's okay. And that's okay for people who want to be scientists. Absolutely. Really? Yeah, because if I, I had known that, I might have had a different uh, life. <laughs> I, I hated math as a kid, and I was horrible no. at it. Oh, absolutely. But I realized that I had to make friends with it. Because okay. we were not on first name basis. <laughs> and then after I learned that I could actually learn it, then it started to change the way I looked huh. at things. Huh. Yeah. There, there was that, like, I remember being in community college and asking my marine biology professor, who was not super uh, hip to this idea, uh -huh. I said, I'm an illustrator. I want to be an illustrator, but I love the ocean. She's right. like, you should draw fish. And that was the end of the yeah. conversation. And, and, and here I am all these years later, and I'm drawing fish in illustration for science. And so I guess, you know, community college, she didn't really push me on the path, but the, the seed was planted. Right. And, you know, the number one thing in doing science is observing. Mm. Right? So mm -hmm. it's going out and observing. You can't illustrate something yeah. that you haven't observed. Oh yeah, I learned that from researching this book so heavily. Let me tell you, you, I keep bringing up the bait ball. I watched so many videos on bait balls because you could watch them forever. Right. You know where at the end the whale yep. comes and swoops the rest of it. Yep. Yeah, that's, they're fascinating. And there's math. So there are, I have colleagues that look at those fish and how they move and they're seeing math. Right? Because there's, ah. there's, there's, ah. there's, there's coordination to it. Well, you were just telling me that you're going to teach this shark robot to, to think like a shark, right? right? That must be mathy. It is very mathy. And I have to rely on people that are more mathy than me. I see. But that's okay, because I get the minions. gist. You can have minions. I do. Math I minions. do have minions. And, and, and they're super interested in surfing and in biology. Oh, see, that's awesome. Right? Yeah. So they yeah, come yeah. at it from They a have the heart for it. They have the tie-in. So, yeah. Exactly. And that's what brings us all together. I see. So we make a better team. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. That's good to know. Yeah. Well, I'm glad I'm on the fringe of that team in some way. No, you're part of the team. <laughs> Yay. Right? Well, because you're helping us get important information out to the public in a way that they can relate. You know, I'm so glad I discovered you here on campus. I mean, I kind of knew about the Shark Lab because everyone knows about the Shark Lab, but you know when I did that, I, I did an article a long time ago for a comics magazine, yep. and I needed to do the rise of the great white shark population in Southern California, and who better to ask? And so I come knocking on your door here at the Shark Lab. <laughs> like, I drew you in my book. And like, well, it's been so great. And I'm so glad that students have been able to help you with your yes. educational stuff. So I have some great students that have helped you. And as a result, we've got this, this cool, like, sciencey, arty thing going here. Which has been awesome, by the way. It, totally. Um, I, totally. There, it's amazing how much art is in science. Really? And that's why I have an appreciation for it. Well, oh. absolutely. So huh. a lot of what we do, we see things all the time, and sometimes you don't have a video camera. Um, mm, but if you mm -hmm. can describe it to an mm -hmm. artist, an artist mm -hmm. can give you a rendition of that that other people can relate to. Yeah. And a lot of your comic books are that way, by the way. 
You, you know, I, I feel really strongly about putting as much Southern California mm -hmm. into my books as I can because I like have this love affair with this area. Mm -hmm. I just, I've fallen in love with this area. Um, you know, I was a Marine brat and I traveled all around the planet my whole childhood, mm -hmm. but being Marine, we right. were always on an ocean, we were on islands, mm -hmm. we were, and so I was always kind of surrounded by this thing. But we landed here in Southern California and there's something really special about this area. Mm -hmm. And so like my ability to try to put this stuff in a book and then have you check it it makes me feel good because let me tell you, I was a little bit nervous because I'm a, I'm an author, I'm an illustrator, I'm a surfer, yeah. you know, I'm a water girl, right. but I'm not a scientist and right. I did a ton of research and did my best, but it was really great that I could have you here to make sure that I, you know, that I've crossed my T's and dotted my I's. And you did science. a really good job. Thank you. So Thank you. A, a lot of times you have a perspective that most of the public has, right? So as a scientist yeah. who's trying to educate the public about what's out there and why we should protect it. Sometimes I don't have that same perspective and therefore it's hard to relate. So I can you see that, yeah. have a perspective that most people do. Right. And if I can get you to understand those things yeah. and you can reflect it in your book, that means there are gonna be a whole generation of young Americans that will come up that will understand it better. Understanding it from the science point of view. And at yeah. an age where maybe we can build that enthusiasm yeah. and, and desire to learn. Yeah, I think our oceans are so super important and being a surfer and being out in it all the time, I stand up paddle, I kayak, I like in it all the time. And you can see its changes, you can see it as the living organism it is. And, and it's heartbreaking when you know that there's, you know, you can't surf the river because right. it's polluted. You can't surf right. after a rain because we're f washing out all this crud into, right. into the ocean. And that we feel that as surfers and you would feel mm -hmm. it as a scientist, kind of the same thing, but different. Yep. Um, and so we're both trying to get the same message across, I think. Exactly. And the hard part is sometimes we've become so disconnected from nature, right? Yeah. So people yeah. go out and they think the ocean is mine. Yeah. Like it's my playground and they forget that other organisms live there. And the things that we do in our playground can be pretty bad. Yeah. So once people start having appreciation for the animals that live there, right. maybe they'll take better care of it. There is a quote I started the book with, and, and it has to do with like, you know, we're only gonna uh, understand what we are taught, mm -hmm. and we're only going to love what we understand. And so there's this, there's this chain that happens that like once you wake people up to like, this is magic, and you should totally appreciate right. this. And once they buy into that, because it is magic, mm -hmm. I mean like your little tanks here, I'm getting giddy just watching all this stuff, right? Um, but it is magic, and we, we really want to push that message that, um, that, that we want to, uh, protect, protect something that we love. And you know, my, um, my two girls, Sam and Jade, in my books, in my mystery books, mm -hmm. they're surfers. And that was just sort of backstory for my mystery. And I, I really felt strongly about having like a, a field guide to the ocean mm -hmm. as a companion book, because I was hoping that someone who was reading these books, whether they're in Southern California yeah. or they're in the Midwest and going like, oh my gosh, I can't imagine seeing this ocean thing for the first time. I want to inspire those people um, to understand this magic mm -hmm. that we have out here yep. and love it. And, and the thing that I like about it is there's a realism to your art, right? So things look real enough that even if they're out and they see it, they'll recognize it. And Hopefully, that, yeah. That's important because, you know, it's, it's good to be able to get them to understand some of these concepts and to understand the animals that they'll be sharing the ocean with. But what good is it if they can't recognize them? Yeah, yeah, I did. And what I tried to do with this book is I, I made like, like an appetizer, mm -hmm. because I mean, there's, the ocean is infinite. Oh, yeah. People have asked me in interviews, you know, how did you decide where to start? Right. And it is infinite, and I thought I have to start in my fictional surf side, which is really Southern California. I figured I'll start right here in stuff that I would encounter right. on a daily basis, yep. because I needed some sort of, some sort of work place to start. Right. And then from there, it's just little bits of physics and little bits of biology, um, hopefully enough like of a mm -hmm. sound bite, a little morsel that person can understand mm -hmm. and not be too overwhelmed with because it can be overwhelming I think so there's so much ocean you're saying your books like a gateway drug <laughs> that's correct to knowledge it's a I gateway drug so. to knowledge yes I hope so and I love it again